You're welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that wonderful time of worship. My prayer is that the joy of worship will never elude you in the mighty name of Jesus. All right, tonight we have a study that is titled Your Gain at the Cross. A few weeks back, we've been talking about the temptation and the, all, all that Jesus went through before um, the time of his crucifixion and, of course, his resurrection. Last week, especially, we looked at the topic of suffering for Christ. And we did read about how there is a privilege that is accosted when we are able to actually um, suffer for Christ, where we experience a little bit and be part of the suffering that he experienced. And tonight, we want to go a little further to appreciate the fact that when we experience such suffering, just like Jesus suffered, it is not for nothing. There is a gain that comes out of every suffering. In fact, there's that saying that says, no pain, no gain. Another word for suffering is pain. And whenever there is pain, roundabouts of it, there is always a gain. Let's open tonight with a scripture from Colossians 1.24. And it says, I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard of Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body. Let me read that same scripture to us in the New Living Translation. It says, I am glad when I suffer for you in my body. Can you imagine that? I am glad when I suffer for you in my body. For I am participating in the suffering of Christ that continue for his body, the church. What does this, what does this want to show to us? There are two things that we gain from this. I mean, you will have seen some people who will say that for some reason, they, they allow people who they are mentoring, people who they are looking after and discipling, they want them to experience a little bit of what it is to have a tough time. I know of people today who, will, who are early risers. They wake up in the morning, very early, smart and then start their day and then they try as much as possible to bring their children up in the same way so that they can wake up early and start their day because it just happens to be that mornings are good to start up now i know that in the complexities of the cosmopolitan life some people's day are night and some people's nights are day depending on where you work but there are two things that you will get from this scripture. The first one is that every time a Christian is experiencing persecution, trials, persecutions, and um, suffering, he's saying that it is as though Jesus is being persecuted in that person. They are having a measure of the suffering that Jesus has to just look, have a taste of how it is. Have a taste of what it is. Because sometimes, in, unless you know what people go through, you don't appreciate how they are or what they, what, what they are seeing today. A lot of people want the glory of people, the outcome, the success. But you need to also ask for how did they get there, the process, their storyline, how they got there. So the Bible is telling us here that when we participate in that suffering, when we have the privilege of engaging and being part of the suffering of Christ in our body, is as though we are 
having a slice of what Jesus went through for the example of the church. If you don't know what it is to suffer a little bit, you never appreciate what it is when you see people who are successful. Because you think it's just an easy, you know, an easy thing. Another thing that you find out when you look at that scripture is that the love of God needs to be incarnated in the lives of his servants so that others may have a life object lesson of the love for them. It is important so that people can appreciate you. People can know exactly what it is that you are worth as it were. A taste of what you go through is important. You know, it's often said that, you know, between husband and wife, the wife will say, I mean, I've heard of people, um, ladies, who when they were having their children, they make sure that their husband had a slice of the suffering and the pain that they experienced having that baby at labor. Unfortunately, I've heard people being beaten, men being beaten. I've had ears being beaten. I've had fingers being beaten. Why? Because, I mean, it is just, so you, do you understand what I'm going through? And you are the cause of it. But whatever it is, my prayer is that whatsoever any source of, any sort of joy, any sort of suffering and pain and trials that we go through there will be a gain the sad thing is when somebody experiences a suffering and then the gain is denied of them that would not be your portion in the mighty name of jesus people need not to only see the fruit of our ministry they need to be able to discern the process the process has hidden in it the pain. How did you get there? I know there are some parents today who just show their, their children the glory of their riches and the glory of their success. How they have bank account full of money. How all everything looks okay. Get new cars, get new houses. I know go on first class trips and so on. They never take time to show the children how they got there. You need to show them that there's hard work behind those successes. There's a lot of pain, as it were, to go through to achieve all those successes. It is this process of suffering and the effects of, of it in our lives that makes people to value us. Makes people to value us. When people see the stripes, you know, talking about football, you know, we've heard what, when, when footballers say, bend it like Beckham. Bend it like Beckham. And then, you know, of course, people want to, nobody wants to play football, and then there's a chance of a, of a free kick within the box 36. And you want to try and bend it like Beckham. You can't just bend it like that, like that, just like that. When Beckham, David Beckham granted an interview, he said at some point in time, he practiced up to 500 free kicks a week. I'm not even sure whether it's per day. 500 trying to bend it. Imagine somebody on a field with maybe 50 footballs and then try to bend it and they will go and pick all those balls back and then try to bend it again. Imagine hours that he will spend on that field until he now begins to learn how to bend it. And then he began to bend. So when he comes on the field and then just bend it like that, that is thousands of trials that didn't work out. 
you must learn to pay the price of the success that you want to see when you pay the price then you are qualified to get the price when you engage in suffering for one thing or the other you are due to get the gain that comes with it don't forget the title of our discussion today is your gain at the cross it keeps us from pride it enables people who see us to have deep understanding of how God works in our lives. It makes people know that God is not a magician. Because if, God, if people think God is a magician, they will just stand, fold their hands, and expect God to make success to just fall on them. Don't just pray for success. Pay the due diligence for success. Hard work brings success. Timekeeping brings success. Due diligence, integrity brings success. All those things are important. Don't just pray. After you have long prayed, they need to get to the rudimentary process of seeing success or gain happen to us or profit fruitfulness will only come when we bear the price when we pay the price a farmer who wants to harvest if he's not an armed robber or a a a i mean somebody who steals will learn to cultivate their own farm plant their seed, water it, make sure the weeds are not going to kill the harvest, and then at the harvest time, they will also harvest like other diligent farmers. Don't just leave the field un uncultivated and then fold your hands and expect there to be a harvest of fruitfulness. It doesn't work like that. 1 Peter 5.10 says in his kindness god called you to share in his eternal glory by means of christ jesus so after you have suffered a little while he will restore he will support and strengthen you and he will place you on a firm foundation you have suffered a little while then he will restore you then he will support you then he will strengthen you and then he will establish you on a firm foundation i pray that will be your, pro your 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 process of elevation in the mighty name of jesus our reaction to suffering shows others our love for god and our maturity in god how do you react to suffering how do you, do you begin to curse God or try to want to make God feel bad? Somebody said, God, where were you when all this was happening to me? What were you doing? What were you looking at? And God said, the same place I was when my son was being killed. The very same place. Don't let your suffering, your trials, your tribulations to make you misappropriate your senses about God or talk to God anyhow. Okay, let's look at what are the gains. Like I said earlier on, gains come from paying the right price. There's gain for each and every one of us. And it's always worthwhile when you know that there's a gain. The Bible says, for the price that is set before him, Jesus did what? He endured the cross. As long as you know that there's a price, I will pay the price. I will pay and carry the cross. So you too 
Why not find out the benefits of your, of your I mean, what, what you like to, I mean, the, the, the way that um, motivational speakers talk about it, I mean, yeah, he said, look at what your goal is. Set a goal for yourself. And then marry the goal with the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the process of what you need to do to get the goal. As long as you see the goal, you'll be encouraged to pay the price. In the same way, I want us to look at this tonight. I've got four to share with us tonight as the gain for the cross that you will carry. Every one of us have a cross to carry. You have your own cross to endure. You have what you need to do to get hold of your success, to lay hold on your success. Number one, at the cross of Calvary, Jesus paid the price that took your place. He took your place. He took my place. Don't forget, we were, I mean, literally, it was when he was made to appear before the governor. And the governor was trying to get out of the, the trap. And he said, oh, this man, I mean, the wife warned him and said, that man has not done anything. Don't get involved in all these um, Pharisees and Sadducees trying to say that you should just kill him or, or crucify him. And then he thought, mm, what should I do? Then he thought about an idea. Now listen, not all good ideas are God ideas. He thought he was going to get out of it. So there was that terrible gangster in prison at that time. He had offended every, I mean, he was a state prisoner. Kept in the dungeon, sentenced to life in prison. I mean, he was hidden in the dungeon of the king, of the governor. Never to be seen. In solitary confinement, as it were. So the governor said, let me try this. Okay, you said this man has blasphemed God. Okay, he sent for Barabbas. He said, go and get me Barabbas. And they brought Barabbas. And then Barabbas was somebody that no, everybody feared him. Everybody feared him that we would rather he rot in jail. So he said, which of these two should I free? Barabbas or Jesus? Guess what? He thought it was a good idea that would make Jesus go free. But the mind of the people was so deprived and has been sunken into darkness that they said, free Barabbas and kill Jesus. Oh my God. How do you comprehend that? That is how it feels sometimes when you have a good idea that is not a God idea. It sounds good. It sounds logical. It sounds as if, yes, that will work it out. But the governor got it wrong. The people demanded to free Barabbas. Barabbas became a free man. Barabbas was a murderer. Could you imagine even the people that he killed their families said they should set him free and kill Jesus. Jesus who was innocent. Jesus who was wrongly accused. Barabbas was guilty. Barabbas should have rotten in jail, in prison. But the people said, free Barabbas. In the same way, here in the world, we were born into sin. We have been made to be guilty. The Bible says we were born in sin and in sin we were conceived. But when Jesus went to that cross of Calvary, he took our place. The same way that he was substituted for Barabbas. Jesus was condemned so that we could go free. 
the circumstances gave us a, a clear picture of the substitutionary nature of Christ's work on the cross. When Jesus hung on that cross, he hung on that cross to take your place, to set you free, to deliver you out of that affliction, out of that pain, out of that habit, to redeem you from everything that has forsaken you and have dragged you down. To make you see the light and delivered out of darkness into the marvelous light of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus took your place. He took my place. And that is what we'll be celebrating at Easter. In another two and a half weeks from now, you'll be Easter. Don't forget because he went through that pain. He went through the suffering. He hung on the cross. You don't need to go through it again. He substituted himself and he made himself guilty. Apostle Paul said, God shows his love for us that while we are yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. You see that in Romans 5.8. He died for us. He took our place. Amazing. So that's one of the gain of suffering. Number two, another gain at the cross. So when you think about the cross, don't just use the cross as a, as a jewelry. When you see the cross, when you hang, when you put it on your neck, I mean on your neck as a necklace, you know, you have it on your wrist. Let it remind you that Jesus paid a price on the cross. And that cross should set you free, should give you a reminder of what your gain is. The second gain I'm going to point about tonight is that Jesus didn't just go to the cross just for the fun of it. He went to the cross and took your curse away. There's a curse that was hanging on us at the cross of Calvary. But Jesus took it away from us. When the Roman soldiers were mocking Jesus, what did they do? They placed a crown of thorn into his head. They put it together with spiky pains, as it were, thorns. And then they sat it on his head and they pressed it in so much so that it punctures his skull and blood were gushing out of his I mean I mean of his of his head, dripping on his face, right on him all around. That was an image that was so clear when somebody is crowned with a crown of thorn is a, sig is a symbol of a curse in the society that we had then. A symbol of a curse in the world to show that this person is of a low, you know, to behold. Let's read from Genesis 3, 17 and 18. It says, and, the, and to the men he said, since you listened to your wife, and ate from the tree whose fruits I commanded you not to eat. The ground is cursed because of you. And your life, and I mean, all your life, you will struggle to scratch a living from it. Verse 18 says, It will grow thorn and thistle for you, though you will eat of it, of its grain. Can you imagine? That was where the curse came from. The thorn was there to prick, to cause pain. But it says we also eat from it. But Jesus came to take that curse away. He came to give us a redemption. Furthermore, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, there was darkness all over the land at, at 3 p.m. I mean, from, from noon to 3 p.m. 
it was, I mean, you can imagine, it was meant to be daylight at 12, but just turned into darkness. That was a cost. My prayer is that your noonday will not turn into darkness. Every thing that the devil might want to put in your way, in your life, in your home, in your marriage, in your finances, in your career, that, make, that will make your day to turn into darkness, I forbid it in the mighty name of Jesus. It's a curse. When what is supposed to be bringing you life is not bringing you death. What's meant to be bringing you joy is not bringing you sorrow. The Bible says it is only God who blesses and don't add any form of sorrow. I pray that your blessings from God will not attract any sorrow in the mighty name of Jesus. All those curses from wheresoever it is that it came from, the blood of Jesus will destroy them tonight in Jesus' name. Jesus bore the turn and darkness of our sin upon himself at the cross. Jesus Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. It is written, curse is everyone who hung on the tree. That's Galatians 3.13. Curses everyone who hung on the tree. To be crucified in those days is, is something that is like to bring shame to a family. Yet Jesus was publicly crucified. He did that to take away that curse away from us. Every curse that the enemy has placed on you that you have been delivered from, they will never return into your life in the mighty name of Jesus. Number three, another gain that we inherit in covenant at the cross of Calvary through Jesus is that Jesus clothed us. Jesus clothed you and he clothed me. The book of Mark records that when Jesus was crucified, they divided his garment amongst them by casting lots. To decide which of them should take it. They were casting lots. Mark 15, 24. Then the soldiers nailed him to the cross. They divided his clothes and threw dice to decide who would get each piece. I mean, they actually pull it and pull it and tore it into pieces. After they turn to the pieces, they now threw dice to say, who will get what? Imagine it was a shirt. Who will get the collar? Who will get the arm? Who will get the whatever it is? And that is in fulfillment of a prophecy that is in Psalm 22, verse 18. That prophecy in Psalm 22, verse 18 says, they divided my garment amongst themselves. And threw dice for my clothing. It was been been foretold long time that that was happened. This man, this wicked man, took Jesus' clothing for themselves. Ironically, they didn't recognize that through the cross, Jesus would be clothing his people. He was made naked to clothe us, to give us a covering. To give us that intimacy with God. Isaiah wrote, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My, lo my, my soul shall exalt in my God. For he has clothed me with the garment of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness. Isaiah 61 verse 10. God will clothe you. The, the, the manifestation and the understanding of the clothing of God in your life so that you don't suffer shame, so that you don't suffer the kind of, the kind of pain, endless pain that the enemy wants to throw at you, has been throwing, throwing at you. I pray that God will reveal such to you 
and bring it into manifestation in the name of Jesus Christ. Through his death on the cross, Jesus covered the shame and our nakedness by giving us the robe of righteousness. Hallelujah. When, you know, I always say righteousness is not about, you know, do's and don'ts. It's about immersing ourselves in the understanding of the rightness or doing the right things that God has given to us the privilege to be part of. It just, you know, agreeing and be part of God's way of life. There's always a, a right way of doing things. If you know the right way of doing things, why do it wrong? Why choosing to do the wrong one? I pray that the joy of righteousness will not elude you in the mighty name of Jesus. He said, He's clothed us with the robe of righteousness. You just develop the interest to want to do the right thing. Just want to do the right thing. It could be difficult at first, but the more you get doing it, the more it becomes natural to you. It's like telling lies. Once you, I mean, to try not to tell lies in the first place would be hard, would be tough. You just force yourself to say, ah! And then you do that. And then the more you try it, the more you do it, and you find that it's now, you know, just part of your life. Now become a lifestyle, not to tell lies anymore. Then you're free. The fourth gain of the cross through the death of Jesus on the cross is that Jesus gave you and I open heavens. He gave us an open heavens. When Jesus died, the curtain in the temple turned in two from the top to the bottom. You see that in Mark 1538. Mark 1538. See, and the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. What does that mean? The curtain in those days separates the holies, the, the, the inner chambers from the holies of holies. So you find that no one can go beyond the inner temple. There's the outer court, the inner court, and then the holies of holies. Between the inner court and the holies of holies is a curtain. And that curtain separates where any man could go to apart from the priest. Only the priest can go into the holies of holies. And even when the priest go in there, he must look at himself to have been sanctified and clean and repentant. Because if you go there with your hands soiled in sin, the person dropped dead in there and he's pulled out of the holies of holies. When Jesus died on the cross, we had access. The Bible said that curtain that separates the inner court from the holies of holies was torn into two. What does that mean? Open heavens. Come boldly into the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy. We don't need to send somebody into the holies of holies anymore. Jesus gave us an invitation into the holies of holies. That's why you can pray to God yourself. You can talk to God yourself. You can approach God all by yourself. It is only sin that separates us away from him. And once that sin has been paid for at the cross of Calvary, by the shedding of the blood of Jesus, everything that separates us from God was taken away. Mark 1.10. He says, And Jesus came up out of the water. He saw the heavens split apart and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, You are my dearly loved son. 
you bring me great joy that will be god's pronouncement and promise over you in jesus name you are welcome into the presence of god you're welcome into the family of god you're welcome into the arena of people who love god jesus will later associate his crucifixion with baptism that is mark 10 38 he says, you don't know what you are asking. You are able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink. Are you able to baptize into the baptism of suffering I must be baptized with? You know, God is saying, I mean, Jesus was saying to his disciples that if you want to, you know, be part of what I am going to be experiencing, in terms of the suffering is also the baptism into the body and into the suffering that jesus was going to go through and when we partake in that we also partake of the blessing of the open heavens that is given to us in christ jesus brothers and sisters tonight as we end i want you to have the confidence that to enter into the holy place of god through the blood of jesus that we should renew our lives in god we should open up our hearts to god and let him key us into the newness of his promise for our lives every time you remember easter don't just think about the fanfare the chocolate i mean you will have started seeing the chocolate all over the stores now. Easter egg, Easter egg, Easter egg. Easter is not about Easter egg. Easter is about the liberty and the confidence and the redemption and the freedom from darkness into light. Let's share it amongst ourselves. Let's tell of the reality of the goodness of God over our lives. Let's let people around us, neighbors, friends, even on your, those of us on social media, don't just get into all the, you know, all the other things that happen on the social media. Why not use your social media for something that is intelligently brilliant to the glory of God? I'm going to leave you with this admonition. This Easter, why not make up your mind that you will do it differently by sharing your faith in this very special way with someone. In a very special way, we have two weeks now. It's good enough a time to plan of what you will do differently this Easter that will make the reality of God not just open to you, but to somebody around you. Plan a meal, an Easter meal with someone. That you can share fellowship of God with. Visit a family. Maybe a family that is left by themselves. Why not buy a gift for somebody you have never bought a gift for? Even just a card. A card to just say to them that you know what? I love you with the love of God. That is good enough. When you do this, you are taking the example of what Jesus did. Because he never knew us. But he made himself relevant to us. So much so that all through our lives, we are enjoying the goodness and the favor of God. In the mighty name of Jesus. Invite somebody to church. Why not go and pick somebody and let us celebrate Easter together. Let's have the greatest fun that the world have ever seen. You know, there's that debate that, is it Christmas that is the greatest celebration or Easter? Well, that is still left for debate. But in terms of reality, the fact is that if there's no Easter, if there's no Christmas, there won't be Easter. And then if there's no Easter, you know, Christmas will just be another baby that was given birth to, that lived and then died. But Easter made Christmas a fundamental success in the agenda of God for our lives. I want you to just know that both of them, there's no competition between Easter and Christmas. The two of them complement themselves to fulfill the purpose and the glory of God in our lives. 
and let that be the wisdom that you pick from it. God bless you. Happy Easter ahead. And I hope that we'll have a beautiful and wonderful April in Jesus' name. God bless.